Who are you calling a f big nose, man? Jesus. <laughs> right. I, I, I guess we can actually go right into it. Yeah. Uh, like what? One, two, three. Boom. We're live. Hello, Hadi. Hello, Marco. It feels a bit fake almost saying how's it going because we talk on a somewhat regular basis and we just talked, but still, how's it going? Well, yeah, that is true. But folks listening to this probably don't know how it's going. So, you know, maybe we should take a few seconds and say, good. <laughs> yeah, good. good. <laughs> exactly. No more, right? I mean, how is it going? How is the pandemic treating you, Marco? <laughs> you know, the, the other pandemic than that. Is, is treating me well. I've just come back from a dentist. I'm still breathing. I'm still smiling. So uh, I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. But what I actually wanted to ask you uh, is I've been browsing the Kato website. And I noticed, having not much done with Kato myself yet, it says it's such a good framework for connected applications. What is a yeah. connected application? Um, so I guess any, any type of application that is using uh, services, servers and clients, right? So, you know, whether it's your HTTP API backend, uh, whether it's uh, microservices, whether it's a website, essentially anything that you could build nowadays. Ktor is a framework that provides support for not only server-side development, but also client-side. Uh, so that's why we kind of use the word connected as opposed to you know server-side web framework or client-side web framework, because it, it actually provides you with uh, the full um, stack in terms of connectivity, right? When, you, when you say client side, what, what does that mean? How does it, how does it work? HTTP client. So we provide HTTP client support. Uh, so you can have a, in fact, the multi-platform aspect of K, because Ktor is multi-platform right now. Uh, multi-platform is only supported on the client um, fully. So you have, uh, you heard my tick there. I don't know if I should just start again. Sorry, I didn't. No, you, you. you give it a go. I want to keep it as casual as possible. It's all going okay. in and without any cuts. Oh, oh, God. Oh, never mind. Okay. This part. Oh, God. So we have the Kator client side, which is the multi-platform part, which is supported in JavaScript, uh, Kotlin native and uh, JVM. But essentially it's HTTP. So connected means, you know, if I'm making a microservice and then I want to connect that microservice to uh, another microservice, what am I going to use? I could use an HTTP client, which is also provided with Ktor. That right, makes I sense. See. Yeah, it makes sense, yeah. I actually wanted to ask you a bit about the development process behind Ktor. Uh, more specifically, just a couple of random questions. How many how many people are working on Ktor at the moment? How many developers? Uh, developers, there are uh, four. And in total, we are seven people. Let me count that correctly. No, developers, there's five, and in total, we're seven. Correct. So five right. developers and seven on the team. And how, how often do you um, release? Uh, how often does a new version come out at the moment? Uh, so to give you a little bit of history, Ktor um, had, you know, it was mostly two developers that were doing Ktor and a bunch of other things. Uh, and then from around March, March, April timeframe, uh, we revamped the team, uh, made a larger team. And uh, one of the goals that we had was to actually increase the releases. Uh, because before KTOR was around um, a release every three, four months, right? Mm -hmm. And it was a tediously manual process. I mean, we were using Team City for building, but everything else was really, really manual, right? So the the steps in a release were something around 26 to 30 steps, which is, you know, you, there was this big readme on, um, on GitHub, which is like, do this, then do this, then do this. And then if that is okay, do that. And then if it's not okay, do this other thing. And, you know, I'm like, this, this shouldn't be like this. Uh, so one of the commitments that we had with the team was to release once a month at a minimum. Uh, so one once a month we have a minor re a, a patch release or a major or a minor, and then once every year we have oh sorry not once every year three times a year we have a minor slash major release depending on if we break backwards compatibility or not because we're using semantic versioning. 
Uh, so right now we're at a one month release and we've managed to reduce the steps to down to around five steps from the 30. Um, most of it now is just automated on Team City. There are a few manual steps still that require uh, going to Maven Central and stuff because you know you need to publish some stuff and make sure that Maven Central gets it correct, etc. Uh, but other than that, it's mostly automated now. What, what so once a month. The, what what made the whole thing so complicated at the beginning? It it wasn't. It's not that it's complicated. It was. It wasn't really owned, right? There was there was two developers that were working on fixing bugs and maybe some new features, and then they were taking turns to release this, and there wasn't really any proper build process in place. Uh, so, you know, having said that, Ktor is a little bit more, um, not complicated, but requires a few pro steps in the build in that, for instance, you know, it's multi-platform, right? So we have a, we have a matrix of configurations. Um, that that required to be executed and tested. And before this was on Team City, and basically it was on a concept of, okay, let me take a previous configuration, copy it and paste it, and then change the Java environment under which it runs so that now I can, you know, run my and compile and run my tests on the Java 8 and Java 9, for instance, let's say. It wasn't even using templates in Team City. Um, so one of the things that I did was basically move to Kotlin DSL and uh, have all of these combinations generated dynamically. So now, for instance, you have, you know, with Ktor, you have a, a build that needs to be tested on Java 8, Java 11. Um, and then for each one, you have to test it on Linux, Windows, um, uh, Mac OS, and then, you know, on the native side, you have to do further compilations. Then on JavaScript, you have to. So there's this, you know, matrix of different possibilities that you have to build and compile on. And so that in combination with then publishing the, the artifacts to Maven, which in itself is a problem, which is still kind of like manual because Team City does publish it, but we have to do checks to make sure that it's published correctly. And then you know, um, because when you publish for folks that don't know, when you publish to Maven, it basically, uh, a it publishes a pardon. It's a pain. Well, apart from that, it, it publishes to, to a staging repository. Then you got to close that repository, make sure that there's, it's all good. And then if it's all good, uh, publish it, you could automate that. But right now, as, as I said, like we went from 30 steps to, to, to around five steps and now we're finishing it off to basically, basically you push a button and, and, everything is good. But just to go one uh, step back again, um, so you have one, let's say, source repository, and then as it sounds like you have a, a huge suite of tests, I, I guess, and at the end you want to have your, your artifact uh, coming out of the build chain, or what, what, what does the whole build pipeline look like? Yeah, so I mean, if we were to look at the build pipeline in reverse, at the end we basically have a bunch of artifacts, right? Uh, we have artifacts, which are the dependencies that people use to when they want to use Ktor, and then we have a couple of other things. One of them is the website, that gets updated. Uh, the other one is the API documentation. Uh, and the other one are is the actual documentation and samples, right? So um, that is the end result of, of a release, right? And then before that happens, we need to uh, run a series of, of tasks, which is building and compiling, uh, sorry, building and running tests for each of the different combinations of platforms and JDKs um, right. or JavaScript or Kotlin native. So for example, we have a Windows machine that a Windows agent that basically compiles uh, native for Windows and runs the test for native for Windows. We have Mac OS agents that run uh, and build for Mac OS and run the tests. We have around three, around 4,000 tests right now. Um, some of them again end up one of the biggest problems that we've had is sometimes we have flaky tests because a lot of them have to do with HTTP uh, timeouts and things like that. And, and you know, we need to fix that as well, right? Uh, but we've got about 4,000 tests. How, so those tests it, need to- How long does the test suit run? How long does the whole thing take? From start to finish, it would probably take about three hours to release. Um, then it depends on what we're building. So for example, JVM is pretty fast. 
uh, Kotlin native on Mac OS takes about an hour uh, to build and run all the tests, uh, maybe a little bit less. So it kind of depends on, on, on the whole, on the area that we're focusing on. Uh, so, yeah. So, but one of the things that like we've automated as well is the samples, right? So for instance, right now, all of the documentation, uh, you know, we had this complaint that, uh, our docs sometimes have outdated samples, right? Mm -hmm. So now what we've done is the documentation is actually referencing real life code base in the sample projects. So that means that we will never end up with documentation with code snippets that do not compile against the latest version because they're being checked during the build process. What's the documentation written in? Uh, it's written in uh, our internal system at JetBrains, which we call web help, um, so to speak. Uh, and but but basically, for folks to understand, it's Markdown in combination with uh, some. Well, you can use HTML as well, but it's Markdown in combination with some. Um, uh, uh, what what is the word for it? Uh, you know, markers that that allow you to tags that allow you to insert code snippets, etc. Right. Did you did you guys ever have a look at ASCII doc? I mean, or is that just? Yes, I, I believe that. Well, we I I didn't uh, in the context of Ktor. I'm, I've a li little bit looked at ASCII doc, uh, but we don't use it. Right. Yeah. A uh, web help is is very also you know it has a lot of uh, features but which are very um, targeted at the type of things that we do. So, for instance, you know if you look at our IDEs, I don't know if you've, if anyone's ever gone to look at the documentation of our IDs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but if you do, there's a little drop box at the bo at the top, which is key map, right? right. Um, so you can select your key map. So when you do so that is already taken care of by web help, right? So the the authors that are writing the documentation, they just say, the keyboard binding for this action. And then it takes care of it. Right? So there's a right. lot of things that are done specifically also for our tools. I see. Um, is there something keeping you, by the way, from just releasing a nightly build? I mean, nothing right now, that? right now, absolutely nothing. Uh, the only thing is that since the, from the time that we published to Maven, it takes around 10, 12 hours for those, uh, to be, you know, available on Maven. Uh, other than that, nothing. I mean, we're down to about two and a half, three hours now. Right. And, and, before we we you know we 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 took on this this team, it was taking us one and a half days to release, one and a half days, two days to release. Now we're to down to about three, four, two two and a half, three hours. And again, there are still a few manual steps, but those manual steps are more kind of like verification, which we can obviously automate. But I, I, as I said, like if we've gone from thirty steps down to five. We'll manage to get down to one or two, right? Just yeah. a matter of time. Just going a step back because you seem to be somewhat happy with the the current uh, build pipeline and the process. Um, in general, what does the development process look like? Who decides what features go into Kato and what you want to put into a release and all that kind of stuff? So we're doing some sort of product management on on. At Ktor, which is part of my role, uh, ironically, uh, and the way that we basically do it is we have a roadmap. So we've made a public roadmap, and we say, okay, for the next twelve months, we're going to concentrate on these aspects of of the of the product as a whole. And then that roadmap we break down into individual um, work items, and then we basically sit and say, okay, well, this is what we need to complete first in order to get to the next step, right? And that's how we basically plan out the next uh, features and bugs that are going to be resolved. Uh, we have quarterly planning meetings. Uh, and then, of course, new feature requests come in. Those start to be processed. They'll be starting to add to the backlog. And then we're evaluating them and see, well, you know, where should this go? Should this go in the next roadmap? Or is this something really critical that we need to adjust our current roadmap and, and fit in? Um, but so far, we're kind of sticking to plan. Do you, do you accept, how does, do you accept contributions from, from the public? I mean, is it, yes, is it like an yes. open repository? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get, uh, Ktor is completely uh, open source in that sense. Um, we do allow uh, contributions. We have pull requests. In fact, one of the pain points that folks were complaining about were that we weren't uh, 
resolving the pull requests fast enough. And that's something we've improved on as well. So now we're processing PRs um, as fast as we can. And yeah, there are many external contributors to, to KTOR. And we've got that in the build pipeline as well. So, you know, pull requests are validated against our build now to make sure that they're green. Automatically? So every pull request you just uh, trigger build or how does it work? Not every, not every pull request, uh, but the uh, ones from the team are, uh, because we work on a pull request basis as well. Uh, so we don't push to the main branch. Uh, we, you know, base it on our own branch. And then uh, external ones, we haven't enabled that yet. And I'm not sure if we're going to, uh, but uh, we'll see. That was actually a sort of my next question. So, um, no, no trunk based development. No, everyone, everyone works on their own feature branch and then pull requests. Yes. The idea is that the main branch should always be green and ready for release. Okay. And did you ever do it differently or just from the beginning, you just worked with that setup? Well, since, since I got involved with the team and, and managing it, we've routed, we've opted for this route. Um, I'm not sure how, I mean, before it was just two developers and, and again, it was, you know, they were releasing every four months. Um, so I think that, but I do believe that they used to still work on their own branch. I see. Well, I guess it kind of sums up what I wanted to know for now. It's a bit, that was quick and short and nice and dandy, uh, learning about how Kato is being built and being developed and whatnot. And uh, just trying to get a feel of what different software solutions, how different software solutions are being built and uh, what the build pipeline looks like, tests and all that kind of stuff. So that's all I wanted uh, to hear from you today, Hadi. Oh, thanks for the chat. Yeah, I appreciate your time. I really do. And Thank uh, you. we're, we're going to see what it's, what it's going to look like on video. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is video? Oh, yeah, I didn't yeah. know. I should have I, I should have made my hair nicer. So. <laughs> uh, just the very first test run, but I appreciate your time. And um, I'll talk to you in a bit. Great. Thanks, Adi. Alan, are we caught? <laughs>